Do you guys prefer a big bad evil guy that is a monster or a humanoid? Humanoid. Definitely humanoid. Why? Uh, because it's easier to give him... in like Because there's more intelligence to it, so it's a, it's a smarter bad guy. And that, in my opinion, leads to a better encounter for not just me, the DM, but the players especially. If they're fighting something that's intelligent, uh, and there's a conversation and some dialogue to be had, preferably back and forth over... A large campaign uh, that's better than just showing up and fighting the evil dragon that they've now shown up but a dragon speaks it can okay, sorry not dragon tarasque sure okay. okay you know it's just there's more to it terry i think i prefer monsters because they're more fantastical right and so uh we can really lean into that I, the, the humanoids i end up hating them too much because uh because i can relate to them and they're not so otherworldly or fantastical way you're like oh that's just what the monster's like the monster the dragon's gonna dragon you know uh but with uh with humanoids it hey dick you obviously shouldn't be doing this so please stop you know so uh, i would say monsters i like humanoids for the personal touch like they're always the second last bad guy yeah. so that they get all the catharsis out of the way before they go fight the tarasque or the super elder elemental or whatever it is right the big epic scene at the end It's a Mimic, the roundtable Dungeons & Dragons discussion, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode in our conversation on the big bad evil guys of Dungeons & Dragons that we like to call portfolios. I'm Adam, and with me today are Terry and Dave, and this episode is called NPC, Now Presenting Combat. We previously covered a whole host of monsters and creatures from the many different corners of of fifth edition. For all of those episodes and more, including a buttload of humanoid mob monsters, you can jump over to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and dozens of other podcast apps, or you can check us out on YouTube and uh, look at the playlists on monsters that we've built there. This episode of the It's a Mimic podcast takes a sidestep to finally address the most common kind of enemy in Dungeons & Dragons fifth edition, the humanoid NPC. Sometimes they betray, sometimes they get betrayed. Sometimes they're lethal, and sometimes they're regretful. Everyone has run into them at one point or another, but this panel of Dungeon Masters is going to try to break down new and interesting ways to go about using them. This episode marks the first half of the conversation, but it's important to know the broad strokes before you dive headlong into the nitty-gritty details. Normally for these monster episodes, we have three monsters and we do stat block breakdowns. We'll worry about the stats and shit the next time we circle back to this. So for now, we're going to get into kind of the motivations, the, the who, the why, and the how. But before we get started, Dave and Terry, how often do you lean on humanoid enemies compared to the plethora of monster creatures in the various bestiaries? Should we roll? Yes. Sure. We got a dice tower now. Five. We're in Studio B. Oh, 19. Okay, 19. I got a three. Hey, I'll go second. Uh, honestly, I work 90% out of modules, so whatever they tell me to use is what I end up using. If I have to go and pick something uh, for like a one-off or like a one-shot, maybe I've got two players missing but the rest of us want to play, I'll just go through the monster manual and find the first interesting creature that I don't think we've ever fought. Well, okay, hold on. Let me let me change the question for you then. What's the percentage of humanoids in Mad Mage versus monsters? A lot. It, it's it's the, there's so more than fifty percent. We're only partway through. Sure. Okay, but... but it's been goblin tribes and drow for a while. Drow for a while, and you get down to Skullport. There's you know colonies of bugbears and stuff, right? So. Yeah, there's monsters lurking about. There's ropers and stuff, but I mean, it's the 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 bad guys are humanoids. The the antagonists are humanoids. You're also running through Candlekeep. Yes. Most of that is humanoids, right? Uh, so far, we're only on I think the level six adventure, five adventure, I think. Yeah. Well, you're about a third of the way through then. Yeah. Terry, I have since switched my methodology on this. I used to start earlier with humanoids and then advance to monsters later on. Not like 100% each, you know, like a more humanoids at first. Because my thinking was there's more interaction, it's more likely to pull the players into the game if it's a newer campaign, and then we can start to get out of creatures on for, uh, after that. I've since reversed that because I found that, especially with newer players, they, it's, the, it's the role play and the interaction and that kind of thing that they're slower to come into. I thought it would actually pull them in. But if you start off with monsters where they don't have to relate to them, there doesn't have to be an emotional connection, they don't necessarily have to talk to them, uh, they're more likely to get stuck in. You start with some combat, uh, then they'll start to talk to each other, and then you can start to include more humanoids after that when they're already bought into the game. 
For me, I on, like yeah. honestly, I always put NPCs as humanoids with a couple of monsters. I always have a couple. Like, you guys right now have Nothix, yeah. right? And you had an ogre and a, a manticore mm-hmm. in the last campaign, right? Like, I do like having NPCs that are monsters. However, for the most part, I give a shit ton of humanoid NPCs and stick them in the middle of nowhere and have everything outside be monstrous. Right. So that the world feels dangerous and foreign, and it isn't until we finally get to civilization that, you know, you start to get into the humanoid bad guys. I've done that now fairly successfully, I think, mm-hmm. for three different campaigns where it's been just kind of out in the wilderness. Like, it was you guys um, on the road with all the refugees for a while, up before you fought the Children of Laughter, right. way back when. And then you guys were on ships fighting aquatic beasts and stuff, and ending up fighting undead swamps and whatnot for a while before you got to floating cities. And now, Dave, you guys are trapped in a desert in your campaign, and there's just random encounters of crazy bullshit coming out at all angles, but there are so many NPCs that you were having to escort through as well. Yeah, to get them through the monsters, I killed a purple worm at level two. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, uh, how? Mystery. It's a mystery. So there, there was a portal that was a uh, one-way portal with electricity sparking off of it. Dave lured the purple worm up to hit the portal, which was an instant kill. So he used his his character as bait, essentially. Yeah. So <laughs> we were doing the traditional experience points for that, that you would have, oh, I would have gone three, level, level. three levels instantly. Oh, yeah, it would have been great. <laughs> I, I tried, but he wouldn't let me. <laughs> so, all right, let's jump into this conversation about NPCs. Um most humanoid NPCs are defined by something different than the playable characters. The playable characters, of course, are based on their class and then race and then um, background, kind of in that order. That, that's what we talk about, right? He is the fighter, he's an elf, and he is also a, a far traveler or a hermit or whatever the background is. However, when it comes to NPCs, they kind of flip it on their head a little bit. It's the occupation first, and then kind of their social role, and then their lineage. For example, you have the goblin or the elf. Right, And that is the first thing that you see when you meet an NPC. A goblin is walking towards you on the road, or there is an elf in the marketplace that you're going to go talk to. right? And then you have a context for them. They're the butcher, or the mayor, or the bartender. And then, if they don't have an occupation, you tend to give them some sort of social role, like a mother, or a refugee, or a prisoner. right? So this is how we think of our NPCs by the general broad stroke. So I figured this was a good place to get started with it because that's kind of what you're introduced to um, when you meet an NPC for the first time. So let's roll initiative, guys, because I got questions. Okay. This dice tower is amazing. Six. Four. I, I'm going to answer all of my own questions first for sure. the next little bit. Then. Why should today be any different? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Fuck you. Um, so first and foremost, when it comes to building NPCs, when do you take them from generic set dressing to give them a unique personality, right? When you walk into the marketplace and there are 300 NPCs walking around, you're like, oh, there's a group of half elves over there. And then there's this uh, uh, carnival barker who's trying to get people into the freak show on the far corner. And like, there's all this shit going on. At what point do you say, okay, this guy's going to have a backstory. He's going to have relationships. He's going to have motivations. For me, I tend to do that all on spreadsheets way ahead of time, but I'm a little rain man about that shit, right? So, like, if <laughs> I know that most people don't, but it's really useful for me to have these massive spreadsheets so I don't have to think on the go. I can react naturally, and I know when, because fuck Terry will always say, Hello. what's his name? Right. God damn it. But, it. but in my defense, I'm the most bought-in player. So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You are. You're not doing it to be a dick. Dan does it to be a dick, but I, uh, I I have to have those answers. Otherwise, I go. His name is Grodrick. That's not gonna work. No, me. it That's isn't right. Work. So so I, I lose the suspension of disbelief. Uh, Dave, when do you do it? Are you next? No, I think Terry. Terry was six. Next. Yeah, I have these uh, like drag and drop, um, essentially like NPC sort of character sheets, and who I think these personalities and traits are going to apply to. And then if the players don't show any interest in those NPCs, but I'm still pretty adamant that I want to use this personality later, I might remove it from like the goblin bartender and kind of drop it onto another NPC later because it's going to have no consequence because they haven't interacted with that person yet and they show no interest, so it won't affect their game at all. Do you have almost like neutral masks on them and then you'll put them where they need to be? Right, yeah, absolutely. And then I will typically move a, a player um, into more of a unique personality as soon as I get any kind of reaction from a player. 
and it doesn't need to be that they favor them at all. It's just even if you say something, like you just say there's like the gothy looking warlock in the corner and somebody goes, ugh, I'll go, all right, well, we're going to lean into that later <laughs> on. And maybe not today, but we're going to lean into that. Uh, so yeah, I just look for any kind of reaction from the players and that lets me know that I'll double down on that NPC. Uh, I mean, I don't, period. Uh, most of the modules that I run, the NPCs are pre-built. Uh, however, I, I do kind of do what you do, Terry, where when I see them latch on to something, when I describe what's going on out of the module, even if it's something that doesn't lead anywhere, if they latch onto that, I'll, I'll make that happen. Yeah. See, this is why I really wanted you on this episode is because you don't do homebrew as no. a general rule. However, I do a lot of homebrew. You do a lot of <laughs> homebrewing in the modules. So yeah. at what point, like at what, how involved do they have to get? How invested do they get before you start taking side notes? Uh, not very. Uh, I mean, our, our WhatsApp chat is, you know, titled after these two goblin NPCs who died saving everyone else, you know, Boblin and Goblin, or Hoblin and Boblin. Fuck. Uh, Heroes Forever, I think is yes. the name of our chat right now. Kills me. But, uh, <laughs> we play very different Dungeons and Dragons. Videos. But on, on level two in the Mad Mage, they come across a goblin king whose name is Yek, and he's got a circlet of human perfection. So when he's wearing it, he turns into a human. They also had a goblin that popped up out of an elder rune yeah. uh, down there, and uh, they didn't know what to do with him. So I kind of alluded to putting this, you know, circlet of human perfection on him, and now all of a sudden he's not just Yek, or, or he's taken on the personality of Yek. This the circlet, which was just this mundane object, well, not exactly mundane, but yeah. this common item has now become this key to this another personality. So when the goblin puts it on. He has now become Yek the 35th, and he has all the memories of the 34 previous Yeks. And if this Yek dies and they recover the circlet, they can have Yek number 36. So I went through and I made um, a character sheet for him so that they can carry him through. And, you know, we'll, we'll change some stats as it goes, because, you know, if this goblin that they have and put it on now was more of a healer in his tribe, maybe he's a cleric. Right. Maybe the next one was a, a, a warrior. Maybe I'll give him a base of a barbarian, but it's still going to be Yek. Do you, do you always give them classes? If I write a character sheet for them. See, I, I'm i always tempted to do it, and I've always resisted it. Now in Tashes, they've got the ability to do sidekicks. And I and it breaks down. There are three basic ones. There's Expert, Spellcaster, Warrior. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And they progress. they've got level progression and everything else with them, but they only have about a third of the power of, an, of a player. Well, I mean, that's what mine do as well. I don't give them everything. Like if, for instance, Yek the 35th, I made him a Cleric, he does not have access to all of the cleric stuff. He isn't turning undead, and he has a very limited selection of spells. Right, like it, it's so he's a priest. He's not a cleric. Yeah, he he. They didn't have a healer. I mean, they did. They had a druid, but he wasn't healing. He was too busy sitting in the corner casting shillelagh every round. But uh, they they you know have augmented with it now. Yeah. If he dies, they're not going to miss him. If he doesn't, that's that's good too, right? So, what's your method for fleshing out an NPC then? I mean, Dave just talked, Terry, Dave answered the question early. Um, when you are like, hey, we have a main NPC that's going with the party for a while. Right. How do you do it? Do you build a character sheet? Uh, not at first. No, I'll just cement important things that I think uh, need to be established because the PCs will kind of uh, infiltrate that. So I, I need to know what, like, what they want. Uh, what they're afraid of, where their loyalties might lie. Uh, but I don't think too much at first because it's it's almost like analysis paralysis. If there's too much to think about, it becomes too wooden. When you're trying to think of 50 other things as a DM, you know what it's like. So I'll just typically have those those kind of three or four things. You're more role-playing than, than combat mechanics when it comes to this. Yeah, but also because for my NPCs for combat mechanics, I go with the idea of, and I actually learned this from you, Adam, is that not everybody's a combatant, and most people are not the psychopaths that these adventurers are. And so <laughs> when an owlbear appears, and they go, what shall we do? Shall we circle it and then attack? My NPCs are going, what the fuck are you talking about? Why would we ever do that? Yeah. Not at all. I'm a blacksmith. Like, are you <laughs> so I kind of lean into that. Okay, I wanted to ask you, because I do it a little bit differently, because I don't bother with character sheets anymore. That was so much fucking work. I only do it in rare occasions. Bernard the Bard has a character sheet. Actually, he's got like six. One for level five, one for level 20. One, sure, yeah, because right? you need him a different sure. But, I mean, for Yak... In, in, in my head, Bernard the Bard is like the merchant Resident Evil 4 that just pops up every three levels, and what would you like to buy an item? Right? Uh, <laughs> like, he's just always around, but he's never there when you want him to be. Yeah. So... Yeah. Um... 
I use cue cards. Yes. Right? I like little recipe cards. And I put down, I'm, you've seen me do this forever, yeah. right? And I put down the ne- like just the necessary mechanics. So you have your six stats and a proficiency modifier so you can build their saves and skills and shit as, as we go, right? Yeah. And then I'll list out one or two attacks. And then do they have dark vision? What languages do they speak? Role-playing like necessities from there. And that's it. Like uh, race and... I think sometimes I put class on there just to give kind of a basic shorthand understanding of who this character is. Right. But for the most part, I don't bother with that shit, right? Yeah. Does that work for you as players? I, it's funny. I've never asked that before. I just do it because it's good shorthand for me as a DM. Do the cue cards work for sudden combats? And, and Yeah. I, I use the cue card method now. They're like recipe cards. Yeah. yeah. I, I use that. Yeah. Because it does work so well. Yeah, I like it. I like... I show up to sessions. A lot of people have computers and they're playing on that. No, I want to feel my stuff. I want to hold the paper. Yeah, me too. Right? So, that yeah, it works for me in that fashion. Okay. It's easy to organize. It fits in my dice box. Let's go. Yeah, and that way I can manage a, a stack of 40 NPCs. I just literally deal them out to the table and say, everybody gets six. Let's go. Right? Mm-hmm. So... Um, Somebody should get you like a Rolodex for Christmas or something. Do, do they even sell those anymore? Yeah, I was in Staples God, the other day. Staples, the, yeah. Absolutely, I was there last week. And that would be perfect for you, Adam. Alphabetical order, Rolodex for your NPC. Oh, that just makes my my organizational boner just like I I have the boner right now. That's amazing. Yeah. Yes, I'm gonna need that. So there's some basic staples of NPCs, right, that we all know and love, right? So, so there's the bartender, there's the mayor of a small town. The quirky merchant, the mysterious quest giver. We've seen this shit so many times, right? But there are essentially, I was thinking about the different kinds of NPCs that exist that are your base combat NPCs. And I kind of narrowed it down to being four. You're, you have definitely fought these four kinds of NPCs in the past. So I, I want to go through them. Uh, we're going to use the same initiative here. I want to know you guys, um, actually I'm going to go last because you guys don't need to hear me ramble more, anymore. But uh, have you used them before? As a DM, do you like to use them? Do you have any tips or tricks about them? So the first one is, Terry, I guess, yep. bandits. Uh, yeah, bandits want something in particular. So the combat, the the puzzle really, within I like puzzles within combat, is that the bandits are not necessarily trying to kill you. They are trying to get something specific from you. And so how they move, the techniques that they use, are, 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 I would always have it based on they are trying to take something from you. They're like... Bandits are also pirates, right? Like, yeah. Clearly, then they're not there necessarily to sink your ship and and slaughter everybody, right? So, have you used them as a as a DM? Yes. And and do you like using them? Bandits? Yeah, I love them. Yeah. Dave? Yeah, we did the when we first switched from three point five to fifth. We did the Lost Mines of Fandalver, and in uh, Fandalin, there is a group called the uh, the Red Red something, the Red uh, Brand, I think, uh, bandits. And they've kind of come in and taken over what used to be a thriving mining town. And one of the side things that we did, I can't even remember if it was part of the module, was to get rid of them, give them the boot, take over the You'll town. Liberate take over the town. Yeah. yeah. So that's really been the, the biggest way I've used them. Um, and, and yeah, it was successful. It was They were able to coexist in the city and be around them without having direct confrontation. So it was always that little bit of background tension where they have to make sure that they're acting properly in the town. It's, it's interesting that, that, that you talk about that because in my head there's a distinction between bandits and the next group, which is thugs. And thugs, in my head, are the urban version of bandits. They're the guys that are going to jump you out back behind you know the mm-hmm. the bar. Whereas bandits are very much um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Yeah. Right? Where they're like popping out of the trees and they've got the little like hiding hatches of leaves and shit that right. they're running around. So that's how I make a distinction in my head. Do you not make the same distinction, Dave? No, it's all a bandit's a bandit is a bandit. Yeah. If they're a cr- so you just lump them all as criminal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess the difference would be, I mean, organized or not. Yeah, and I guess that was the next thing I was going to say as well. Bandits are organized. There's a bandit captain. There's not necessarily a leader of the thugs, and the thugs in, are often, for me, very ineffectual street toughs that are meant to make you turn and walk the other way. But if you get in a fight, even a, a one-on-three fight, you will win against thugs. 
Yeah, I th- I think with bandits, I see it as like you know they kind of honor among thieves, and maybe perhaps there's more loyalty among their group. You know, if it is pirates, they're kind of all working. They may be part of some sort of rogue guild right. where thugs may not be. But thugs, I take it as um, kind of like like street gangs that you see where they might say there's loyalty, but hey, it's funny how they all soon run away once you know they respond to strength and they, their tactics will be different. They'll likely all try and pile on one person and kind of jump them, if you will. But as long as you if you start to take one or two of them out, the rest of them may start to move away after that. Yeah, so to me, a thug would be uh, just like the the one or two enforcers from the organization that have come to shake you down. Okay. Right? Or or the guys that are stopping you in the alley and trying to get your stuff. Those are thugs, right? But, I mean, bandits, to me, that has a level of organization to it. Also, I find that bandits and thugs both tend to be territorial. They can be, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, you're not going to run into them way out in the middle of nowhere up a mountain, right? Bandits tend to be along... Um, waterways and roadways and, and streets and, and thugs in my head are back alleys and, you know, these four city blocks is our territory and, you know, um, which leads me to the next one. Everyone has fought a guard. Mm -hmm. And I mean specifically town guards, the authorities, not quite police, but kind of police, the city watch, right? So, um, not detectives. These are the, your sergeants and your, and your, um, uh, privates and your corporals, right? The the street level city guard. Terry, any any thoughts? Do you? I know you've used them in the past. Yeah. Uh, do you like using them? I do like using them, but remember, guards are not military. Okay, guards are not soldiers. Soldiers, it is. It's like they're three hundred. What do we do? Aru. Like that's their job. They train. They know formations. They know battle tactics. They they know what to do. Guards are people are, are not well trained. It's essentially shift work. They stand looking over a wall for 12 hours. They don't want any trouble. They want a quiet shift. Uh, they will likely not have loyalty to each other. If shit really kicks off, they probably do not really know what to do. They got their training five years ago. No one's ever mentioned it since. Um, so you have to remember that guards, while they wear a uniform, they don't don't expect the same level of competency as you would from uh, from soldiers. It's, it's interesting, sorry, because when you get into some of the uh, books, like in Eberron specifically, off the top of my head, they have specific city guard um, like organizations. Yeah, the Black Lanterns. Yeah, yeah, which are definitely militant, and they are there right. for a reason, but they're not just city guards. They're not going to break up the, the tavern brawl. Yeah. They're there to, like, hunt you down and make sure that you're following the law. Sort of. I mean, I always, like, like Terry was saying, there's the soldiers, and then the city guards, they're, they're the police, okay? They're, they're, not, they're not military, they're paramilitary, right? Uh, and you can have... Because they, they come in twos. Yes, of course. Um, but you can have specialized groups within the paramilitary organization that are assigned to tackle certain things. Right. But as a whole, they are just uh, city watch or the police to me. They're the ones wandering around looking for thievery in the markets and making sure that, you know, shit's going smooth. They're likely motivated by different things as well. You know, military and people that are going outside of their city, they'll have a lot of like, uh, you know, it'll be very probably like patriotic, they'll have a lot of pride. You know, the guards, they may be more ego driven because they want people to see them parading in their uniform and they want to, same as you see in the movies. I also think that you're going to get more uh, corruption out of it low-level city guards than you will out of, out of oh, the military. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I think about when it comes to guards is I break them down into two separate groups in my head. There are the sentries, which stand still. Like you say, stand on top of the wall, they look out over the wall. Eight hours later, they go home, yeah. right? And then there's the patrolmen. And they're a little bit different. They're a little bit more proactive. And I really like patrolmen, especially against your players, because... They've got a routine, and a smart player will figure that shit out yeah. and use it against them, right? So I really like that, as opposed to just, that guy there is holding a pike, he's standing by the door, what do you do? It's a whole lot different to say, you have two and a half minutes before the four guys come back. Yeah. What do you do, right? And it, there's a, an, a sense of urgency that gets added that I really like um, when it comes to guards. Yeah, I think with the patrolman, just to add on, I'll, I'll contradict myself here. I said earlier, oh, they, they likely don't want any situation. They want a quiet shift. A patrolman is the is the good time to use that person that's just cut. He wants something to kick off. Give me an excuse, motherfucker. That yeah. would be like a patrolman. Yeah. yeah, but the guy just at the city gates checking papers is not looking for... that. That's the bored TSA agent, yeah. right? That just like, come on. You're white, go on through. It's all good. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, 
Um, so the last group is cultists. Have you used cultists? Uh, I have not used cultists. I am like prepping a game that nobody's going to play for 10 years or something. But uh, the cultists are going to be a bigger part of it. So I haven't, but I have experienced cultists a lot. Have you? Yes, I think so. Uh, but, well, yeah, I, I, I know that. You were there. But, yes. <laughs> I might have set them against you. Um, do you like fighting cultists? I, I I love fighting cultists, but I think we can get a little bit more creative with them. Yeah. You know, there's a lot there's a lot more we can do. And there's different levels to cultists and how devout they are. And, and you know, and so that will mean different things for them as well. But, uh, yeah, I love cultists. Dave? I have never really played against or with them oh, wait. In, in D&D. We did some in Call of Cthulhu. Yes. Wait for it. They're coming. Like, that's... My okay. campaign is, is gone. I mean, I guess i got a couple yeah. of buddies who are probably in a cult of some sort. Too. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's my only real experience. Um, I freaking love cultists because they are, A, willing to fight to the death, B, have a very simple and straightforward motivation, and C, probably have wands. Yeah. So you're, I get to do very simplistic um, minion battles with cultists. I tend not to bring them out at low levels, although you totally can. I like to keep them for the mid-range so that... I can add, these guys have a wand of magic missile. Now your AC doesn't matter. Yeah. What do you do? That guy has a level three magic missile, right? Now what do you do? I, I took down Dan's level 17 character with six cultists spread out with wands of magic missile. He was a, a battle master fighter by himself. He's like, I can take on these low level NPCs. Nope, just toast. They took him down, guaranteed hits. I mean, diminishing returns as he wipes them out one at a time, but you put them 45 feet away from the next person, it takes them an entire round to get there, and he just took so many more magic missiles to the face. Yeah, they'll fight dirty as well, but dirty yeah. in the sense that uh, don't expect them to follow the same code of honor as you do. They have their own code, but it's likely not the same as yours. You know, they're, they'll probably do some pretty awful things and things that you wouldn't necessarily expect to happen, depending on who they're devoted to. As a general rule, if I'm going to threaten children and pets and things, I'm not relying on bandits to do it. I'm relying on cultists to do it. Yeah. They're, they're evil capital E, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's a sound clip right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, not every opponent starts out as an opponent. Sometimes the merchant catches the players stealing, stealing something. Sometimes the kobold sidekick gets tired of always checking for traps and getting blown up. And, you know... Sometimes there's uh, the love interest that catches the bard cheating, right? There are lots of different ways to, to get someone who's either neutral or an ally and turn them into a sudden opponent or opposing combatant. Terry, when do you decide to take a neutral NPC and turn them into an opposing combatant? So the easy way is when the players have undoubtedly wronged this NPC yeah. because there's players they don't players as we've already established do not give a fuck about people only animals. Uh, so uh, when they've undoubtedly wronged the NPC or when they don't stand up to their side of the agreement, yeah. that's a good way. So with um, with uh, NPCs, set the expectations early. Like what is the what is the social contract here? And then once the players start to go against that. Give them a little bit of fair warning, maybe, but all you should always have it to where it's it it's never just just because it's because you fucked me. That's why this is happening, Dave. You you hit the nail right on the head. They have to do something. If it's a neutral NPC, I probably didn't have any real plans for them, anyways. But yeah, I'm not talking about sudden and inevitable betrayal. I'm talking about like the, we were on decent terms. I was gonna give you guys a five percent discount. Until you did this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The one that always comes to mind for me is the very first session that I played, Terry, uh, in Curse of Strahd with I, you. I know what you're going to say. I'll let you tell the story. But yeah, <laughs> that was what was in my mind as well. Uh, where we went into a store. We got into Barovia and we went to the first store. I mean, everyone's like, oh, civilization, head to the store. We want to gear up first. And we had a party of six, uh, two of which were murder hobos. Uh, Jamie was a uh, murder moderately housed he wasn't quite a hobo but he was like he had a little bit of, of like a murder prince i think he yeah. was prince of his people so. <laughs> yeah um and then there were two brand new two girls that were brand new that had never played the game before they had played like one session and was just going along to get along and i'm playing the lawful good cleric like fuck right and so we walked in and they start looting the place and they attack the shopkeeper and you're like okay was well, got this big strong you know stock boy in the back's gonna come out like kick ass 
I'm outside because I don't want to be a part of this shit, right? Plausible deniability. I know they're up to shit, but if I don't see it directly, it's okay. That is, uh, I am I am going to just say crime happens outside of my view 100% of the time. Um, so it's okay if another one happens and I can't be to blame for that. But fuck, was that just a shit Didn't show? Didn't we end up on the roof? Yeah. At one point? Like, yeah, we were... flying kicked somebody off the roof or something, I, I uh, we, recall. Someone uh, got, <laughs> like a, got a wand of teleportation and sent the guy to... Sent the stock boy to the other side of the freaking... No, sent the shopkeeper to the other side of the city, of this small village. And so there was a number of rounds before he was going to come back. He's hoofing it back to where he was. <laughs> As they're, like, looting the place, the stock boy, uh, no, I know what it was. I walked in and saw him choking out our fighter. And so I asked you, are lungs open containers? They're not. Six years later, they're not. <laughs> they were that night, for that, and, he, Dave. and he drowned. Don't fall for that. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I created uh, water, not food, uh, in his lungs, and then he was drowning. And then I felt bad, so I had to heal him, right, because I'm lawful good. And then everybody else climbed the fucking side of the building for no stupid reason. So I'm standing in the damn shop as the other guy busts in through the door and he sees me healing this guy and he didn't see me in the first place. So now I'm, do I lie to him? It was this whole moral quandary because those assholes wouldn't stop stealing daggers. Meanwhile, I'm 20 minutes into DMing ever. Yeah. Basically, <laughs> it was like the odd one shot with a load of noobs. So, boy, honestly, I think you guys hit the nail on the head with the idea that you have to telegraph this a little bit ahead of time. Let them know that they are fucking up. Not that they have fucked up, right? It, it, you can't just drop, all right, roll initiative. Yeah. You, they have to... Uh, oh, no, it, it's, oh, you wanted this item? Okay, it costs 10% more. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to make them start to, to realize that they're screwing up. It's like, you understand that if you get caught with that much gold out of the register, shit will hit the fan, right? Yeah, it'll be okay. No, not right. Yeah. Okay, yep, all right. When do you decide to make an allied NPC swap sides? Yeah, you have to be careful with this. Um, because players do hate getting fucked over. And so you have to be legit in your reasons for it. And I think it comes back to a similar... It, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be that the players have wronged them. It's, it's maybe more that the NPC is sticking to what they have always said that they wanted. Whatever that is. That they're trying to get their daughter back. They're trying to save their family thing or whatever and if the other side is going to allow them to achieve that better than the players they're likely going to swap sides and whatever the scenario is um but that again needs to be obvious to the players from the start that they are essentially not sticking up to their side of the bargain uh, and so that's why that would happen dave i haven't really done it no however i i know that again with this yuck character uh he had the goblin crown for the, from the king on the other level uh, he has made his intention clear that he wants to um, restore, and I, and I mean restore, goblins to prominence and to get the, uh, the you know, the, people hate goblins, right? They're not welcome in a lot of places. He wants to change that. He wants them to make, he wants them to become uh, functioning members of society. And I know that my players are not going to let him do that. <laughs> okay, I, I I realize one it. of them is Kyle, right? Yes, one of them, and that's the player I'm talking about. Honestly, if it wasn't for Kyle, Yuck wouldn't have happened uh, this way. But I know that that's going to happen, so I'm just I'm I'm ready for it. Like whatever happens, happens. It's okay. It, it it'll happen. But until then, he's going to you know do what he can, and they're going to kind of look at him side eye. But in the meantime, they're they're wondering, you know, is this the time to kill him? Oh, can we get him now? Oh, can we get him now? Right, so, but my guys are a little murdery. Your guys are very murdery. Yeah, so they want to kill everything. Uh, honestly, for me, I will go. I will give almost two or three sessions before I, I turn an NPC, an ally, against the party. If you wrong them, they're not going to be happy. They're going to let you know, hey, that's not okay. And I will almost drop out of character to say that, mm -hmm. just to give the player a warning. But there are some players who do not heed those warnings, and they keep moving forward. Dan. Dan. Jamie was one of them. Um, uh, right now, Charlie is ours, where he does not heed the NPC warning. He says, ah, it'll be fine. And and it, 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 it will not be. It's it, never it will fine. not be. So then the next time around, they're going to withhold something. Information or a healing potion or they've got something that you want or you want them to do and they won't. 
But you know what? Apologize first. And asking a player to apologize, I mean, that just never works. Oh, so man. you Try know that Jamie be... to do that shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, some of my players, like, they don't apologize for anything in real life, yeah, you know? So, um, and then finally, th- I give them almost a three strike rule, right? On the third one, they're going to walk away, and you will hear them mutter, of what's your passive perception? I don't care if it's a six. You hear them mutter under their breath, you better watch your fucking back. <laughs> And then they're going to come at you later, right? The random encounter that you roll on the table is going to be this guy having enough of your shit. Hey guys, this is just a friendly reminder that we keep this part of the episode open and available for not just advertisements, but also to pass messages to the D&D community at large. If you have a Kickstarter, an Etsy store, a social media account, a Discord server looking for players, or a product that you want to promote, send us an email at info at itsamimic.com and we can discuss our reasonably priced media package and what we offer. If you have a great DM that you want to acknowledge, a birthday for someone at one of your D&D tables, or just a general shout out you'd like to immortalize on the internet, send us a message and we'll be happy to do it for free. After all, Dungeons & Dragons is only as good as the people around the table. A podcast is only as good as its team, and a hobby is only as good as the community it creates. So reach out, and if you think this doesn't apply to you, you're wrong. Your message matters. Your voice matters. Your communication matters. Don't be afraid to use this platform to help grow this pastime, this community, and your passions. Again, you can reach us at info at itsamimic.com or through Reddit, Instagram, or Facebook. All right, so there's lots of different kinds of power. Well, I want to talk a little bit about why NPCs are combatants. What drives these these humanoids to do it? We've talked at length about the monstrous humanoids in the past. Um, we did all those mob episodes, right? But when it comes to your elves, your gnomes, your, your playable races, there are a number of different kinds of power. And, and we think political, religious, physical power is one of them. But there's also power in, in sympathy, in compromise, charity, or sacrifice. It doesn't have to be wielding offensive power. You can appeal to someone and, and get them to... A, you can almost manipulate emotions or or wants and needs but for now we're just going to focus on the combat and the might and oftentimes in D&D that translates into firepower political influence henchmen and magic right when you think about the might the power that an that an NPC wields you think about kings you think about cult leaders you think about the people the head of the merchants guild it is a political kind of power now i did a lot of thinking about this in the week leading up to to recording. Um, And I ran across a quote, Terry, that I know that you will love. Sure. Uh, It's from Oscar Wilde. And he says, everything in the world is about sex. Agreed. Except sex. Okay. (laughs) Sex is about power. Yeah. Where where do you land on that? This is totally not D&D related, but I just like, I'm curious. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. It's kind of like, but not in the sense that like, who has power over the other person. It's kind of just more like, which role do you enjoy playing? Wow, we really dived into that. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I would agree. Dave? I I don't know. (laughs) I'm powerless, gotcha. Oh, (laughs) well then. Um, Honestly, for me, when I think about that, I think what he's saying is that... Power, whether it is about sex or not, is about being good enough. Right. I'm good enough to be able to get what I want, to do the thing I want, or to make other people do what I want, or to somehow manipulate my environment, my circumstances, um, and, or my assets to be able to provide what I want. Not what I need, but what I want. And that's true power. It is about the idea of good enough. So when it comes to motivation based on power, you can kind of break it down into four states, essentially. They're the people that wield the power. They're the people that protect the power. They're the people that are getting the power and the people that are losing the power, right? So it's easy to understand that cultists and bandits are concerned with getting power. They're looking to get enough assets to get what they want. A dethroned king is concerned with losing power. I don't want to lose it anymore. Uh, I've lost a bunch. I can't afford to continue to lose face. Uh, Guards are concerned with protecting power, right? So with this framework, let's roll initiative again, guys. Six. 
uh, I'm going first again. I'm going to hold my action. We're just going to go in the same order again. Apparently, I, I got probably. a critical fail. Does that mean I don't get to go at all? Yes, you uh, have to leave. Yeah. No, okay. And you will respond to the name Dan for the rest of the night as well. <laughs> no. <laughs> so Terry. Yeah. What is one piece of combat advice that you have for running an NPC who has superior power when compared to a party? The NPC is the enemy. Yeah. Or the ally. No, the the enemy specifically. Okay, so if an NPC is an enemy and has superior power, and you do not necessarily want them to just wipe the floor with the party. Find a way in which you can remove power from them in another way. So, you know, they may be able to cast Disintegrate, for example, but for whatever reason, they have lost their mobility, they've lost their legs or something, and so they're limited in where they can move to. So now I've removed power uh, from their movement, or it may be, like, their memory or something. But I like puzzles in combat, like I say, and so this becomes part of the puzzle. They have superior power in one area, so how am I going to remove power in another area? You essentially attack the character sheet, but for the NPCs. Yeah, 100%. But then try and flesh it out so it's, it becomes part of the encounter. Of course, yeah. yeah. Dave, what do you do? Like, how do you show or how do you wield someone with superior power in combat? This is where I homebrew without homebrew, homebrewing. Um, I take the stats that I like and add ones that I like as well and take away things that I don't. I, I add to the, instead of attacking the player's character sheet, I add to the NPC's character sheet uh, and try to do things that my players are familiar with, but maybe not super in the know of. Like they know that uh, you can cast silence and they won't be able to do these uh, verbal components to their spells. But what happens if I grapple them in there or grapple their spellcaster inside of that? So I'm going, I'm going to like tactic my way through it if that makes yeah, sense yeah and you're using yeah. specifically might to, to like you're using your muscle to show them the stats to yeah to and, overpower. and i use the dm magic to make the story interesting i mean i i don't the one thing you have to understand is my style of dming is not rules as written at all i use it as a template and as long as my players are interested i keep going as soon as it becomes uninteresting we move on to the next thing right or maybe not even that long like i i, I try to gauge level of interest and go from there and then that's why I, I think it works for some of them because uh, it allows them to latch onto those things and then we work on that for a long long time and we keep going and going and we follow through and we get completion of these things right and in some cases it's it manifests itself into the real world kyle and i had this ongoing thing with this cane sword and he has now gone and gotten parts he's going to make the damn thing you know with this big octopus head like it's it that's the style that i use and it works it works well for me, and I feel like it works for my players, but it's not for everyone, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So what? So when isn't it for other people? I don't know. It's up to them. <laughs> it's a hell of an insight. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, for me, when it comes to wielding power um, in a in combat, I look at the resource that they're wielding, whether it's henchmen or magic or mobility or whether or not they're going to, you know, they've got the the intelligence, the tactics, they can outsmart the players. They know that I as a DM, all DMs are better tacticians than players because we understand 100% of our side of the table. Yeah. They only understand a fraction of it depending on how many players are, are there, right? So it's not a fair match. DMs, you're supposed to lose. So when you walk in with the overwhelming numbers, you have to know how you're going to lose and why. And remember, those motherfuckers... Okay, so here's my tip. Never, ever, ever put your powerful NPC, the king, the general, the cult leader, never, ever put them in melee combat. They should always be at least one move and a half away from everyone else. And I don't mean 45 feet, because that fucking monk and their stunning strike will get you 100% of the time. They'll fuck a two-year campaign up with that set with that stunning strike. I hate su stunning strike. I one hundred percent. Megan is playing a monk right now in the campaign, and I am dreading. She's when crafty she gets it. as well. Yeah. yeah. Megan, so yeah. Um, I, I I know that I'm going to have to use many many minions against a monk. Right. That is just how it's going to be. It will be long combats because she's just going to stun the fucking Tarask, and it just drives me up the wall. But. So my, my big thing is, I want to have the pirate captain standing above the bridge, up by the steering wheel, firing his crossbow while the rest of the pirates are in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I want the cult leader standing atop the altar, 
where they can't get to them except with ranged attacks. I'm going to remove as best I can. And if I have a small room, it's an anti-magic field. Or there's a force field in the way. Or a wall of fire. There's going to be a barrier between. Because, and you see, here's the sneaky thing. If I've got a powerful um, NPC, we're going to see it when he just drops a character. Which means I have to split the party on the battlefield. While everyone else is dealing with the minions. And that's my other thing. Always give minions. Yeah. Right? Because you can just tie up everybody with minions. Um, and the rogue's going to love that. Because they're just like, one hit kill, one hit kill, one hit kill. But when there's seven minions, that's seven rounds to go through that with. Right? Yeah. So, I that's, that's my big thing. And always, 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 unless it's the final battle, you give them a wand of counterspell. Because that's your get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah. What's one piece of role-playing advice you have for running an NPC with superior power? People who have superior power do not need to tell you that they have superior power. It's like that quote about, from Fizzband about the, the dragons, role-playing a dragon. Like, yeah. Just, just relax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. I, would lean right, I would lean right into that, and I 100% agree. I think what we the mistake we make as DMs is we want to uh, create excitement with the players. So we want to demonstrate this power. But... Anybody out there in the world that has true power, the most powerful people in the world are the people that we do not know exist, first of all, uh, you know, if you're a conspiracy theorist. Uh, but then it, it going down in like power positions as well, it's the people, that they don't need to telegraph their, their influence. We're aware of their influence most of the time. Uh, and if you're not aware of their influence, you should become aware of it when you realize how calm they are especially when you're revealing all of your cards. Are we specifically them. talking about how scary Megan is? Yeah. Okay. Megan is a black belt, I believe. Yeah. Dave, do you have any role-playing advice for how to get it, how to get it across in combat that your NPC has a shit ton of power? Yes. Um, Make them float. There it, you go. Next. No, no. It's it's when the player says... <laughs> hair does that thing where it goes up. No, no. It's, it's, it's all about inflection. When the player says, I'm going to do this, you go... Okay, <laughs> right, and then whatever they want to do with that is fine. But that little okay, there's a lot packed in those you know, four letters, the DM you right? Like yeah, that's the DM, you, like that. You don't say but, even though it's heavily implied. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Justifiable. Well, well, and then sometimes, <laughs> sometimes if I really want to make it interesting, I'll roll a die that they can hear because we play online, right? So I'll roll it in the in the the. Um, the hard case instead of the one with the felt liner so they hear that I made a roll now that roll it's probably nothing but they don't know that and now they're on edge again and I built suspense with four letters and die roll right and it works and now they're going to take that and whatever they make of that is what we're going to go with mm -hmm. they'll question their strategy yep yeah um, my big thing in combat for showing you that my guy is super powerful is first of all you've heard his name before combat broke up Right. Second of all, you've come to face him on purpose. And third, he's got minions or he's crackling with energy. Like there's there's that setup, the, the set piece that you, you're giving him. But I'm going to spend the first round just taking all the damage that you throw at me and he's going to watch. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he's going to hold his action and wait. That terrifies experienced D&D players. Mm -hmm. Because holding your action to watch, to learn means that he's going to do something on someone else's reaction. Shit, does he have legendary actions? Wait a minute. What's the trigger? Why is he holding? What is going to happen? What's the thing? Yeah. Right? And I, then, honestly, the next thing that I will do is just give him advantage on the first thing that he does on the next round. Right? That's it. But I, whatever the first round of damage that comes at him is, he will shrug it off. He'll just absorb it to really prove the point that you are beneath me. Do you remember, Terry, the first time that you bumped into Dasher? Uh, yeah. He gave me a gift. He gave you a gift. That he was, threw me off. He was so unconcerned about you that he gave you a gift. Do you remember what that gift was? Craig. No, no, no. no I don't mean the glaive. Oh. He gave you your estranged father oh, on that a torture was, rack. Oh, the weapon was the second gift. Yeah. yeah. That was, but that was right at the start of the campaign. Yeah. And, yeah. and he said, uh, here's your father who you hate. Um... I can kill him, or you can kill him. If you do it, I'll give you a present. Yeah, I didn't. Well, I didn't. I didn't do anything. I didn't understand. I didn't expect it so early. I think. Yeah, yeah. And and sure enough, he flayed your father, who was like the the regent, like the the head of your house, Cassius Hawkridge. Yeah, just flayed him with a snap of the fingers. That was enough, and I did it in front of everybody in the room in a cutscene. 
essentially, where you were able to just essentially, it was a skill challenge. You could roll if you wanted, otherwise enjoy the ride. Here's a scary thing that happens, and then he walks away. Yeah. Right? And that was just absolutely everything I ever needed to do with him. And every time he's shown up in the last, like, four years since, everyone just kind of pees a little bit. Oh, fuck. Yeah. This guy. So, besides power, gaining, protecting, whatever, there are other motivations. So, let's break down the most popular three, and I I want you to give me a combat tip and a role-playing tip. Terry, revenge. What is a combat tip for getting revenge? Uh, as in, like, premeditated revenge? Yeah. Oh, yeah they've, they've thought this through for 2, 5, 10, 20 years. They've been plotting this revenge. So they likely have plan B, C, D ready to go. So uh, for a, a combat encounter where it's revenge is the motivation for the enemy, um, I believe it's okay to have multiple plans ready to go and sort of get out of jail free cards. Dave? I don't know. You, you haven't run into that, hey? Uh, no, there's certainly been, been NPCs that have wanted revenge, but I mean, I've always kind of played them as these are the guys that have nothing to lose. They're, the reason they're going for vengeance is because they have been so wronged that they are willing to throw it all on the line. All right. Well then hold that. Cause we'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that because that's the next one. Sure. All right. Um, for me, revenge ambush. There's a reason that it is happening now. Yeah. And revenge, they don't want to fuck it up. You can make a power play. It can be for wealth or love or whatever. But if it's for revenge, you can't lose. This is your shot. You need to make them pay right now. Why now? So it's not just what you're doing or who you're doing it to. It's the when and the where that that really matter. And it should, should have some sort of irony. The dagger you used to do the thing is now what I'm shanking you in the back with while you sleep. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, Do you have a role playing tip for revenge? Good time for a monologue. It is a good time for a monologue. Yeah. Uh, so I would say if you, if you want to have that, that cut scene, that monologue, if something is revenge driven, when Dasher, for example, showed up and the, like the, the, the monologue sort of begins, the players are much more accepting of that because they understand why this monologue is happening. Even if they hate it, they kind of hate to love it. They want that scene to play out. Yeah. Okay, you talk. We've been going for a year waiting for this moment. So a revenge-driven um, uh, NPC is the perfect time for a monologue. Yeah, it's the Bond villain telling him the whole plan oh, before it happens. Oh, you caught me monologuing shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Dave, do you have any besides a monologue? Uh, a role-playing tip for showing revenge? No. You just really haven't run into revenge as a motivator. And, and when we have, it's been dealt with swiftly. Like, they've messed up. Normally, they don't leave any bodies. Uh, there hasn't been anyone really pop up. Again, 90% of what I do is module-based, so there's not a lot of room for it. So and, thanks, wizards. Yeah, yeah. what the heck? We're not giving Dave any inspiration. Uh, but, but I mean, when, when we have been dealing with revenge, maybe it's um, them going and uh, getting vengeance for this you know, person who was killed to put the ghost at rest kind of thing. Like, we've done that kind of thing. But no NPCs wielding revenge. Not towards them, no. I, I use it as a motivation, not a... Uh, Not a conflict, I guess. The thing that I always do, and it's worked out in my favor, is I do it with an for like an audience. There will be other NPCs there, so that when I am twisting the knife in Dan's back in front of a crowd, he did this to me. I am hitting that empathy button real hard to turn the tide. So it, it it it's definitely revenge, but Dan is the bad guy. Like, the players are the bad guys here. And I want them to feel bad. Aren't, aren't they? Like, the players what? are the bad guys, aren't they? <laughs> are we the baddies? <laughs> <laughs> um, desperation was the thing that you were talking about, Dave. When yeah. It, when it comes to um, a motivation, revenge born of desperation. But it can be its own thing. It can be its own motivating factor. I, I'm here attacking you on the side of the road because I'm starving. I have no other option. Do you telegraph that some way with combat? That's a, from like a, not a role-playing perspective, but a tactic that you use. When someone is desperate, what do they do differently? Yeah, they will typically stray away from normal behavior, right? So it may be that, or, or not necessarily, but I'll explain that in a second. So they would be like particularly relentless in, in their pursuit of like, they just keep coming round after round. It's clearly not working, but this is their, this is their only plan. It's all they have at the moment. 
or a trained person we were going back to guards and like military earlier they will typically revert back to their training automatically in yep. a situation where they're desperate they won't even be thinking they'll just do what got drilled into them for the past five years or something or they will or if for not that type of person if they're desperate there will just be clearly no plan they they don't know what they're doing uh and and so the desperation will kind of reveal itself in that there's no uh, there's no obvious kind of end game they're just trying to do something so dave i mean i'm not sure we we play that deep of a game honestly uh, like I, I know that we do on sundays but for the dm perspective i mean 99 percent of the time my players are the invading force right right so as much as they think that they're the good guys but what about desperation in the sense that like uh what about like if your big bad is like on their last legs or they're losing this fight they never thought that they would lose i would just probably i don't know dm magic my way into making it interesting <laughs> right like that's <laughs> okay but what's your go-to dm magic way to make it that interesting oh i don't know teleport more hit points access to a better spell. Oh, okay so you, just... you you rewrite it like for you What's interesting is well, the big difference between you and I DMing is that by the time we roll initiative, by the time the session starts, my game design is done and I can rely on it and that's it. You, just because initiative has been rolled, does not mean that the game design has ended. You no, know, for, for mine, for, for yeah, you're right. For me, um, when we start our session, I know that in this session I want to get one, two, three points across and this is the major theme of today. Period. Moving on. What do we have to do to accomplish that is going to be purely reactionary based on what they do. It's very interesting to me that you have this rigid module that you follow. It's laid out, and yet you are far more fly by the seat of your pants than I am. Well, no module is the same. I could run Mad Mage six uh, times, and it's going to be I, different I am, six times. I am times. learning that with yeah. Death House right now. Holy shit. But, I mean, that's, that's, that's the way it's always been for me. I mean, I've been running modules since 3.5, and we had, I think it was a four-part module that ran through Eberron. It was something to do with the Emerald Claw. And, like, there were there were bad guys that were coming and going the whole time. But, I mean, it, it, it really did, you know, get so much bigger than what it was just supposed to be because we, we kept, oh, well, now they're on a lightning rail. Okay, well, maybe let's have this fight on the top of the lightning rail. Okay, let's, let's change the setting. Let's change the environment and have these giant set pieces where, you know, you can kind of stop for a second, take a look back and realize that, this is, you know, guys fighting on the train here, guys fighting on the airship over here, and it's a spectacle. It's not just walking through a dungeon or walking through a city street or brawling in a tavern, right? It's There's there's more to I it think, than that. I think that's part of the reason why you like Eberron so much is because it's built to be spectacle. Yes. So, uh, for me, for desperation, honestly, I have to talk my way through it. As much as Revenge was a monologue at the beginning, desperation is begging pleading screaming crying right all the way through that combat um do you have any other like role-playing ideals for desperation besides just like like the the like i say that the desperate um crying out it's almost like an, an anxious energy that that comes to it where they're willing to fight to the last i think it's also a one-track mind right you know so if the when you're role-playing a a a big bad or any enemy where they're they're in a state of desperation, you can also leverage that to your advantage because they can't think about other things. Their their problem solving is going out the window. It's they're like gold thinking. always going for the ring. He never goes for the kill. He yeah. goes for the ring. Exactly that. Yeah, and and you can say that that is a state of desperation for him when he gets that opportunity and it's right there in front of him. Everything else goes out the window. He can't think about anything else at that time. So. Yeah, Dave, do you role play in any desperation at all? We didn't really role play until we started doing fifth edition. So the role play side of thing is relatively new for me. So not not a lot. I have so many questions for you about that. But well, I, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, I mean, I don't know. I like I like the idea of I want you to die so bad I will die to make you die. That's the sound bite of the episode. There we go. Right. The last motivation I want to talk about right now is the city guard and the soldier. The idea of obligation. Right. How do you show obligation? Like, it is my duty to fight. How does that feel different in combat than power, revenge, or desperation? When it's duty, how does that feel different? I think it depends where that obligation ends. Like, are they obligated to die for that person? Are they obligated to just 
protect one member of the party. Hey, I'm here because I have to protect this wild magic sorcerer. I don't give a fuck about the cleric and the bard. They can do what they want over there. Uh, and, and, you know, I, am I obligated to make sure that this item in particular makes it out safe? So the, it, the Han Solo effect in the first movie where he's in it for the money princess and then he's out of here. Yeah, it's 100%. So it depends It depends what the obligation is and their combat tactics are going to be geared around uh, around that thing specifically. Yeah, I agree. It's it's the motivation behind it. I yeah. mean, if the idea of the, the city guard is to make sure, you know, things don't go poorly, if it is going poorly, maybe it's his obligation to go and get help, but then not stay in a fight. Sometimes that that works the opposite way, where they they may be obligated to die to make sure another person survives, and so they'll give their life away for, like, seemingly pointlessly in that, I will stand here and fight so that you get an extra round to escape. How many times have you seen that in a movie? Or maybe they don't, and the person they're supposed to protect dies. Vengeance story arc right there. Right. Yeah, or just a pure abandonment. I mean, what happens to cultists after the god gets banished? Right. Exactly. Like, does everybody go home? We said there should be a campaign too. For the, okay, Adam, this is something you would do very well. The camp, the next campaign should have the same NPCs in it, except now they're like they're working, farmers. They're worth sure. working yeah. the bakery or something. Yeah. Hey, what did you think was going to happen? Okay. Yeah. You guys won the war. I still need to eat. The other thing about obligation is when it comes to soldiers and guards and whatnot. I think that you can you can show that it's a sense of duty by showing respect. Right. Uh, you are a good combatant. Uh, I think of uh, Barrister Selmy from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. Like, he he was the best fighter in the land, but he was never bloodthirsty. Yeah. He just did his job. He did it the best. He respects other people that do it well, and he would rather not put any more blood on his blade. Yeah. And seeing that, I mean, that's not every town guard, but that could be the captain of the guards, right? Who who looks at the fighter, at the battle master, the decorated um, general from three kingdoms over and says, I'd rather not do this. Can we just sheathe the swords and yeah. walk away? Can you just put it down, please, and just leave? And I don't see any reason why hobgoblins wouldn't wouldn't do that. And that's the other thing too. Desperation, that's Knowles to me. That makes sense. That's even that's even the odd goblin or or kobold, right? They're mm -hmm. a little bit craven and whatnot. Revenge is gonna be things like orcs. They're going to come after you. You've you've slighted their honor and whatnot. But hobgoblins are about obligation. And if we start to think about it in those um, though that context, you're going to see more duty in Drow than you are in Duragar. But there's more honor, so you're going to get more revenge out of Duragar. And so, like we said at the beginning, when you think about um, the um, races and the occupations and the social roles. That can kind of give you an idea of where they're coming from. A refugee or a mother might be more desperate than under obligation, I'm here to help you, right? Like, um, so it's it's definitely something to, to think about. Uh, well, now seems like a good time. We can take a, a minute to just shout out. You can always find us on Instagram uh, and Facebook or at r slash it's a mimic on Reddit. Uh, also, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them at two info at it's a mimic dot com. Uh, we're always looking for more mailbag questions. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing another one of those. Those are one of my favorites. Yeah. And uh, again, leave positive reviews, sharing on social media, uh, and don't forget to tell your friends. Word of mouth is a big, big part of this. Yeah, those uh, those iTunes reviews, the five star reviews and stuff, make a world of difference for us on the search engines. So let's move on to the uh, to the idea of how we've talked about who we've talked about why. Let's talk about some of the actual tactics. And the first thing that we've talked about over and over and over again is the idea that you don't necessarily want to die, right? Like, are you obligated to give your life? Not every single humanoid is a fanatic or a zealot. Most are going to want to live to see the next sunrise. And that means retreat if it's possible or surrender. And surrender can be compromise or, or try to parlay or strike a deal. But it does mean giving up. Let's roll initiative. I have some questions. Oh, natural 20 for me. Oh, oh natural it's three. Been so long. <laughs> it feels so good. Terry, yeah. you're going first again. Yeah. Do you have a general rule about when an NPC is going to give up the fight? When hope is gone. But it, it, 
whether that be depends on the motivation, right? But when hope for that motivation is gone, when we're going to make the assumption that this is not a zealot or a fanatic, so but the I, average person, yeah. So when the hope that their payment is gone because the guy that was going to pay them just died, okay, I'm out. Yeah. Uh, when hope that the person they were looking for is gone because you've discovered that they haven't survived or whatever, when hope for their own. So depending on what their motivation is, when hope for that motivation is gone, that's when they give up the fight for me. We actually saw that, and I'm trying to remember what the campaign was. It was a, it was like a medieval campaign where there was an entire. I, uh, I'm going to get all the details of this wrong now because it's been a while. Just make the story up at this point. Oh, once upon a time, <laughs> no, there was uh, a countryside that was, you know, um, rallied to go to war to save uh, uh, someone who was being held hostage. Uh, it was a political thing where, you know, my, my son will be given to you and therefore I won't attack you. And, like, it was a political thing. And then 15 years later they went to war anyway. Right. So the whole countryside went to go rescue this beloved son. And when they saw that they were surrounded, they just took the son up on top of the wall, slit his throat, kicked his body over the edge. And, every, and everyone just went, well, fuck, all right, let's go home then. <laughs> Like it's, it's not worth getting revenge and going under siege. We yeah. will not gain anything for this. Time to just leave, right? So, um, yeah, you're right. Like when the hope fades, it's it's time to go. Yeah, Dave, do you have any? I think this is where my style and everyone else's takes different paths. Oh, you always fight to the death. No, not always. Most of ninety nine point nine percent of the time, yes. Uh, but I'm not as much as I'm telling a story. I'm not married to the idea of this is the story. And, and that can be whatever they make it, right? I'm not saying that I'm going to railroad them hard into this story, but it's not about the story. It's about making sure that everyone is interested in being involved, right? I don't I don't play for a story. I play to have fun. And a lot of the time, I think, for, for, for particular players that have different needs than others, uh, being married to the idea of, well, this is what the big bad evil guy is going to do, is doing a disservice to them as players. So... For me, uh, it always lasts as long as the encounter is interesting. And that is so open. That can be a 100,000 different things. As long as everybody's sitting there having a good time, let's keep doing it. As soon as it starts to wear a little thin and we're kind of bored of combat and, you know, well, this person is getting up to walk around for a second or, you know, I, I know that I've lost it, so let's move on to the next thing. Let's wrap this up. And that, that's how I judge it. That's how I kind of uh, make sense of it all. It's interesting because I'm very much not that way. I, to the point where I know exactly at 40% hit points, they will retreat. And right. that, like, it, that just comes down to it. And this is specifically for cowardly creatures. You talk about hope, but I look at it from the other side of things, fear. Yeah. If I don't want to die, and three other people beside me have already died, and I've, only, and I've got less than half my hit points left, I'm fucking off. Right, And it might be to go get reinforcements, or it might be to go the fuck home, or it might be to go dive in the river and hold my breath as long as possible and hope they just fucking leave. Yeah. Right? Like, it it doesn't matter what the tactic is. At 40%, I stop and think, why are they doing this? When are they going to bail out? Right? And... Uh, sure, that's what I'm saying too, but instead of having that solid benchmark of 40%, it's... I mean, maybe they're going to take off and run away and go hide in the river when, you know, we start to lose a little bit of interest. Yeah, right. honestly, when it comes to losing interest, I have about seven or eight other tactics that I have. But I've played with my players for literally years. I know the style that they like. You're the newest player at my table that I don't know. Yeah. Right? Well, and, I mean, I don't have a playing style because I never do it. Yeah, because you're, cause you're yeah. forever DM. <laughs> Those are the most dangerous players, though, because they don't even know themselves what they're going to tactics. Every right. single <laughs> every single week, I have, I have spoken to Dan before we play D&D, &D, and he says, are you ready? Are you prepped? And I say... Yeah, Dave is going to die this week because well, he's a fucking wild card and I have no idea. Under flaws of my character sheet. He ran and, up and, and punched a gelatinous cube. Did it work? At level did one. Did it work? Fuck off. It worked. I hate it. But there's no backup plan as a DM for that. It's no. Like, you <laughs> fucked yourself at this point. Dave, Dave and is that's my, okay. it's my deck of many things. He's a dick of many things. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, seriously, though, on my character sheet, I have written under flaws, and this is the only... He announces this twice a second. Yeah, yeah. Two words. Confidently incorrect. And that's what I go with. Whenever there's a thing or, or like, a role play to be happening, is he is going to be very sure in his answer, and it's probably not going to be right. Those are the worst people in real life. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so confident, so wrong. Uh, okay, so, Terry, 
How do you get the party of murder hobos to stop attacking mid-initiative? You have to give them something which is more interesting than being a murder hobo in that situation. It's a, it's a new distraction. It's the laser pointer for the cat. It's look over here. That is 100% the correct answer. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, show's over. Let's go home. So, no, do you have do you have an example? Just the, that's not a laser pointer. It, it could that be, would work on Dan. It could but. be like a... A portal opening, but you can see through the portal and something more interesting is on the other side. It could be the big bad trying to escape. It could be an NPC gets dragged off. All right, so let's talk about a, a combatant NPC. Right. Who suddenly wants to stop combat. How do you, how do you get them to do that? Uh, you have to put the, the threat of something that they care about being taken from them. Item, NPC, pet. Y yeah, you have to is. give them reason to pause. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Everybody yeah. freeze or I'm slitting the goblin's throat. Perfect example. Yeah, oh, yeah, that would not go over well. Um, I also, and I've done this to, to pretty decent success, actually. I've had NPCs, like, drop items and go, whoa, 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 stop. Yeah. And that's it. And they just, they just put their hands up and they just say stop. And that will get about half of the players to actually go, okay... Now what? But not the player whose turn is who's is, on is deck. Next, yeah. Then their their arrows draw, and they're like, "No, we don't stop now. We stop after my turn." Again, this is where Zenthos would run in and keep hitting because it's the wrong thing to do, and he's confident that it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and that is when the lawful good monk, the cleric, and the bard go, "What the fuck did you just?" Yeah, do I for? only play neutral characters. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but God, you're so fuck. I hate DMing you. So. The uh, Dan used to be the bane of my existence, but he was at least predictable. Anyway, the uh, the point is that it, that then creates party politics, and that's why I say forty percent and not ten percent, because ten percent then they take the arrow and it goes through their eye socket and they're dead. Forty percent is then Zentos runs up and hits them, and the goblin goes ow, and it's someone else's turn next, mm -hmm. and now we're gonna. I mean, I remember this. Terry, you, you were trying to get Jamie to not execute a prisoner. Yeah. And you reached out, and he was holding the blade to the prisoner's neck. And, and you reached out and grabbed the blade in your hand. And you're like, I'm just going to hold it and say, don't. And Jamie said, I'm going to cut through his fucking hand. <laughs> and, and Terry's response was, well, I'm just going to let go of the blade. It's not worth it for me then. But you really shouldn't do this. And you guys had a little argument at the table. Yeah. That was everything I ever needed as a DM. And it was great to show me that... Uh, a, I have a murder hobo in the party. And B, Terry's got priorities that make sense. I can play with that. Now. Right. Yeah, I remember Kyle one time recently actually came across a village of Kotoa. And they were trying to build this new god or whatever. And Kyle, his character is against gods. And he had decided that he was going to fireball the village of all of the women and children in Kotoa. And there was like 35 of them or something huddled in a cave around a corner and he just walks in from across the river and goes fireball and just nonchalantly keeps on going and the amount of like i i didn't even have to say anything like okay they're all dead it goes off the amount of fighting that they had afterwards mm -hmm. in the party i mean i just sat back and let them go for a half an hour right? i didn't have to do anything oh it feels good as a dm when you get to do that hey yeah um, you can have a snack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's one piece of advice you might have for Dungeon Masters when it comes to the strategy of retreating? Uh, retreating doesn't mean that you automatically run away. Uh, like, you can fight going backwards. There's still a strategy. So that, that's, that's specifically what I want to talk about right now. Right. The combat strategy for, for non-combatants, for non-tactical DMs that are listening right now. Right. How do you pull your forces back? Yeah, you could. So, typically... You like, two are my two tacticians as well on the yeah. podcast so right so uh, like irl what you would do is you would move kind of half at a time and the other time like there's there's like the standard cover fire kind of thing but that doesn't always work with D D. but really what you're trying to do is just uh, change the environments where it favors you for even just one round at a time you're able to you're able to move further away you're dropping darkness you're doing whatever yeah. something Fog something cloud, to put the like environment that, yeah. in your favor not a situation where you would beat the enemy hit points wise, but it just allows you to move away. There's also the the idea of uh, of tactical withdrawal as well, which is you can withdraw from an from an engagement, but it doesn't mean that you're running away. You're just changing it to favor you. So you can withdraw from an engagement, move away, and then re-engage with those people later on. 
So just because you moved away from the bandits, get far enough away that they decide, ha ha, good job, we fucking won, and blah blah blah, and then they go off and come back and see them again when it favors you, and it can be in ten minutes. Yeah, it's like the, uh, the in the with the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson, where they're they're all lined up, you know, the American Revolution, and they send the few forces forwards to engage, and yeah. they turn around and run away, yeah, and they give chase. And then they come over the crest of the hill, yeah. and there's this giant force waiting for them. Yeah, that's right. That that idea is like very, it's very. It's the stormtroopers running away from from Han Solo and Chewbacca in the Death Star. Yeah, and then they turn the corner. And there's like forty five more stormtroopers around the corner. Yep. Right. Often, like uh, like modern day kind of uh, soldiers and military units, if you're sleeping like a woodland or a, or a heavy area, you'll often sleep in like a triangle like this. And so, if you're engaged from one side, this. And like one side of the triangle will withdraw through the v-shape of the other triangle so that they move into it and then you can take them from both sides like this and it's kind of so, the, so you have a, a pincher yeah. yeah yeah i like the idea of using i mean if you got a big bad evil guy and they're engaging the players in combat the minions are not making it out alive sorry guys this is the way it is yeah, yeah. so you you make that's the why minions, you don't have names bitches yeah. right <laughs> you get them to press that's why forwards we don't count your hit points <laughs> go go on the offensive take the take the aggro and then the big bad evil guy is going to slip through the back door. And then when they go into the into the back door afterwards to see what happened, they find uh, an empty potion bottle. He has taken the invisibility potion and has gone. Right. That that's how I would do it. I would use a an item, or maybe he dim doors or teleports, or you know, that's how I would do. It. But you got to have those fodder to make it happen. There are built-in mechanics that high-level and annoying. Uh, monsters get that most NPCs don't have access to when it comes to retreating, and it's plane shift mm -hmm. and other spells of a similar nature. When you see an NPC with counter spell in their list, that is a fucky NPC that is going to retreat. You on T are built to run away. They stab an ambush, and if they don't get the kill, they're going to run. And they've got the stats of like shape shifting into a snake. That is only for retreating right maybe a recon but it's it's to slip through the cracks in the stones and get the fuck out right so you have to think about the spells that are available as well you may not you may be saving your plane shift your counter spell your polymorph for that sudden runaway why would you ever 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 give your big bad evil guy long strider or jump yeah right well this is why and you don't give it to him you give it to the guy standing beside him so that he can cast it and then your guy can dash, right? And so I always, when it comes to the idea that I might retreat, especially with a person of power, I always have someone else watching their back to get them out, right? It's exactly what you said about minions, but I tend to do it with the second in command, the lieutenant that's willing to dive on the grenade, right? So that the captain can live. So Dungeons & Dragons offers us a few combat options that don't really exist in reality, like I said, with the plane shifting, right? So you have instantaneous healing, which doesn't exist in reality. Magical defense, which is just negating damage. Changing the battlefield. Magical attack and summoning. Terry, how often do you use spell slingers in your part, in your NPCs, your enemy party? I like spell slingers. Uh, I like using them as enemies, but I will often simplify it so that it's around one thing. Like it, you know, they they are constantly conjuring things, or they're constantly. Uh, you know, or it's a necromancer based thing. I I don't like throwing too much variety at people. They, they've like, got a theme. Yeah, it's a theme. That's right. And that becomes part of the puzzle that I keep going back to is how do we beat this theme uh, within this combat encounter? But I'll do it quite often. I'll just change the theme. Dave? Uh, as often as they come up in the the module, to be honest. If When you need to beef up. Okay, so I'm going to change it for you because you don't do a whole lot of homebrew. Sure. When I got to beef it up, I focus on Hit points, a couple of spells amazing. that can immediately incapacitate, spells that are going to deal massive damage, and spells that are going to allow them to get the fuck out. Period. I don't deal with this. Create food and no, water. No, fuck that. I don't care. <laughs> right? That's a waste of my time. Um, but, I mean, dropping a fireball, that's great. You know, putting the monk to sleep if you can, if they're a low enough level, you know. Yeah, that's great. You know, get get attack the party dynamic, not just the party. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, take out the healer, you know? That's one of the things that I do. I try not to use spells against the party um, as much as possible. I don't know if you've noticed this yet, Dave, because we're relatively early in the current campaign, but there's not a whole lot of spell casters that you guys fight against. Yeah. There's a lot of monsters and there's a lot of martial going on. 
because I would rather incapacitate you with a grapple and a drag than with hold person. Because I like to save my, myself, unless I have cultists or evil wizards, or like it's clearly that's that's the theme of the next few sessions, right? Um, I want to save the, the magic for later because then I can get real fucky with it. Again, I control the battlefield. I control the bad guys. I control the hit points and I control the tactics. I know if they can, they've got a bottleneck, if they have arrow slips they're going to shoot through, I can control all of that. Which means if I have access to spell lists as a DM, I can be as fucky as I want and I want to save those cards to the end of the campaign as a general rule. Well, yeah, the, the, the one time you use a spell in a creative way, now it gives them that idea and they're yeah. going to use that against you yeah. and that just can't happen. So, Terry, when do you use enemy healers against the party? How often? Not too often, but I'm not afraid to do it. I think you just need to telegraph it ahead of time. I think it needs to become obvious as you come to the encounter that there are healers there. And that's just in uh, the spirit of fair play. Like, don't, you know, don't allow them to put all that hard work in. Then suddenly the bad guy gets healed. It's like, what the fuck? It's my the, final form. Yeah. You, you can do that once at the end of the campaign. Yeah. Okay. I, I let them know that there are healers present. And then part of the encounter becomes trying to stop those healers accessing the big bad. It definitely changes the tactics in the room, doesn't yeah. it? I don't really heal. I'll give them a regeneration, if anything. If it, if it's going that sideways that quickly, I'll just give them a regeneration feature. Uh, however, and I can't remember when or why or who or where, but I, I want to say I was privy to a party where we were going to fight the big bad evil guy and it had been established that there was a mole in his camp. And we got down, we were fighting him, and hope was almost lost and his lieutenant turned around and healed the party and got back up and that was the big reveal right at the end oh, that's fun. so so that was kind of a neat interesting way to see the healer used as an npc on that side yeah i i like healers but i give them very limited ability and it is cure wounds it's it's 1d8 plus oh, con you know right, what am i but... talking about i just i mentioned it earlier with yak he's part cleric yeah, he's a healer but yeah but i mean i mean when the enemies do oh, you yeah, let yeah, the yeah. enemies heal uh no so uh, I very much like to do that, but again, it's limited. You'll see a paladin do lay on hands for six hit points. I don't just suddenly cast mass heal on the whole freaking battlefield, right? Uh, that's unfair, unless you are in a campaign going up against the evil cleric. Then all bets are off. Evil clerics are a nightmare to deal with. Especially if there's more than one, because they're healing each other. Fuck. Anyway, what's your go-to magical defense for when you want to keep a hostile NPC alive? And I don't mean healing. What is the defense, the magical defense? Uh, it's in, like, defending the... Yeah. Okay, sorry. Is the DM defending the... Uh, ah, probably silence. I use quite a lot of silence. Is, uh, you tend to silence in darkness your way through it. Yeah, that's... Yeah, If I unless I have, like, the big fucky things, like reverse gravity or something. Reverse gravity is my, my low-key favorite fucking spell of all time. Yeah, I would have said silence as well. That's kind of my go-to. It, it, it shuts it down real quick. Counterspell is great, but you gotta be a third level caster. Yep. Right? So, and you don't tend to have that many slots. But silence is fantastic. I like sleep at super low levels mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, well, I use sleep really effectively against Megan uh, at the beginning of this current campaign. when You guys were trying to get out of the dungeon. You woke up in a dungeon, you were trying to get out, and there was uh, Fae. You guys kept running into these fucking fake creatures that could just put you to sleep. And the monk would run up, separate the party, because she's faster than everyone else, and then, boop, sleep, and sleep. Oh, yeah, when you killed them, they blew up and put you to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, I was fucking idiot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what's your favorite tactic for magically changing up a battlefield? Uh, we touched on it a second ago, but I love darkness. I love dropping darkness, but follow it up with something, okay? Oh, drop darkness on yourself. Fuck them. Figure it out. Find me. <laughs> Find me. Guess what? I just dimensioned all out of here. You keep shooting your arrows into that black circle. Do what you want. So uh, darkness is great, but make sure you got something to follow it up with. Do you have a go-to battlefield spell? Well, a planar shift. I, I, I like the idea of grabbing another player and just shifting somewhere. <laughs> and then having that little one-on-one, -on -one, you know brouhaha see how it goes see how it turns out yeah that's uh that can be a deadly way of doing it well you split them up right and then the rest of them are sitting there going uh, uh. and the one thing i would recommend though is don't do it to the spellcaster because they're the one that is going to get the rest of the party back into the fight right like give them the out don't just heavy hand your way through it yeah uh, honestly for me it's reverse gravity i i want to fight in the ceiling and i want the desk and the crates to come with us 
I love that because all of their 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 tactics when they when they stayed just inside the hallway and said when we go in we're gonna do this yeah. we're gonna do that all that goes out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and it's a lot of fun too because I will only use it if it's a thirty foot high ceiling. So everybody take three d six damage, yeah, and then use half your movement to stand up and now fight on the ceiling. And everything is difficult terrain because we just broke all the furniture all over. Yeah, as well. So, uh, by the way, he's going to then lose concentration, and we're doing it again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't hit him too hard. <laughs> when when the high level spellcaster holds on to to the rock. And then casts return uh, reverse gravity. Everybody else goes way up, and he just sits there and, and holds on. Um, what's your favorite magical attack against the party? Confusion, brilliant. You cast confusion on that uh, barbarian. I'll see you in two rounds. Bye. <laughs> go, go <for> it. <laughs> that worked to great effect. Uh, we l lopped. You, we killed you. We had to reverse time to undo it with the barbarian. Yeah, it was a minor wish. Yeah, yeah. you had, you use crit tables, which I love uh, usually. Uh, apart from <laughs> with the barbarian in this case, yeah, I think it was confusion. Right, he attacked me and got a crit, and then took my leg off at the hip. Yeah, yeah. that's what it was. But I was ready to go with it. You know, I'm like in the game. I was like, I'll have one leg. Fuck it, let's go. Let's the, leave one leg. They had, they had it's just a flesh wound. <laughs> yeah, that's what they, I had, they had a, a genie wish. Yeah. It's just sitting there waiting to get used. Yeah, and as it, one does, yeah. Yeah, and the ranger just, like, panic button. Red button, eject. That's it. We're going back in time. We I know that I can wish to go back in time a minute and a half. Bloop. And then all of a sudden, everyone's walked through the hallway again. She goes, all right, everybody stop. Oh, God. There's a wizard beyond that door. <laughs> so, Dave, what's your favorite magical attack against the party? Um, This is going to be a weird answer. The one that makes sense. Does that, does that make does that make so sense? Tactical. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, it, it, it has to make sense. If they're going up against this um, uh, the, priestess of Loth, you're going to have darkness cat. Like, that's going to be the one. Yeah, or it's like or a good slam coming together. Right? Yeah, like, you, you got you to pick and choose. Um, okay, so, everybody, obviously, obviously. Everybody loves Fireball, though. It, like, clearly, like, I ask the question because... I design encounters, and I'm like, I would design an encounter around... My answer is Disintegrate. Mm -hmm. I love Disintegrate. That's scary as fuck. Yeah. Especially because I will just disintegrate pieces of an NPC away. Be a beloved mount will suddenly have their head gone. Like, I don't just... I don't just... Focus. Anyway, I could talk about Disintegrate all day. I love I, Disintegrate. I don't. I don't like it. No? It's... No. I sat down to play the first five Oh, I know character. why. Because Dave is still traumatized from Mr. Stark? <laughs> no. Um... <laughs> When I first started 5th edition, we sat in Sean's house and played with Sean and Melissa. Yep. And I had a dragonborn paladin named Rogrin. And I loved Rogrin, but it was my introduction to 5th edition. And we didn't play a lot. It didn't have maybe only one or two sessions. But I had the opportunity to sit in with some other friends. Uh, and so I took Rog Rogrin because he was the same level and it made sense. And I walk in and he's got flame breath and there's a, a mind flare and a tower and we're trying to distract him, so he reaches in through the window and spits fire, lights the thing up, and goes to run away and just gets disintegrated. And then I had to sit there for the rest of the session with nothing to do. With well, that's people. That's not a problem with the disintegrate spell. That that is the problem with with poor encounter design. Well, yeah, it was the DM's fault, and I mean, I'm not going to point fingers, but but who was it? Uh, Reese. Oh yeah, okay. You know who I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. I never, never, never played with them again. James knows who that is. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, no, I, I love, I love to but it's funny, I ask you, you know, like, whichever one makes sense, because you're sitting there working out of the module going, okay, what's the spell list, what makes sense here? No. No? No, 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 I'm looking at a, what in this encounter makes the most sense? What are the, what are the bad guy's motivations? What are his... So you're thematically building. Yeah, yeah, if his spells are all illusion-based, I'm probably going to use something illusion-based. If it's all right, evocation-based, I'm going to do that. But what's your favorite one to pull out? If you get to design it from the ground up. Do you have a favorite spell you like to do? Oh, Counterspell. <laughs> so tactical. Like, Fuck, yeah, all right. Right there. Oh, you, oh I'm going to do this? No, you're not. <laughs> okay, so there's one other kind of spell that's become more popular recently with the new kinds of subclasses and patches coming out and whatnot, and it's Summoning. Do you guys fuck with summoning? Do you have an NPC that casts summoning spells? I have a, a lot of fiends do it. A lot of fiends can summon other fiends. No, and I, I know that if we're going by dice rolls, you're supposed to go first, but I'm passionate about this one, okay? okay. I well, fucking hate summoning. I hate it, okay? We have a druid, 
and we've got this nice little battle going on. And he goes, well, there's nothing I can do, so I'm going to summon four dire wolves. Fuck you. No, you're not. Just to hit him one time. You cast Shillelagh last round with your bonus action. Just hit him. He's got three hit points. We do not need to be focusing on importing these new guys, because if I don't put the NPCs on the table... Oh, geez, the, then, the, then they know that the encounter is going to be over in a second. Right. Well, how come my guys, my, my wolves didn't show? Right? They're going to metagame their way out of that. I fucking hate when my PCs summon guys, so I'm not going to do that to them. Unless a crit table says otherwise. Terry, do you like to summon? Oh, man. Wow. Um, I, <laughs> I don't summon that often. It isn't, I, it, I can't even remember the last time I did. But I think if I was going to, I would try and find a way to summon innocence. Summon like other NPC as opposed to like summon celestial or elementals or whatever, um, because because uh, they don't expect that and that's gonna fuck with them. Summon children. Yes, yeah, summon children. Absolutely. Summon summon children in the river. Now they're just drowning. You have a choice. Or just someone. From oh, that's somewhere. a good way to get away. Well, and that's what I was gonna say. Summoning for me is a retreating tactic. Yeah, I really I really like that. Here's my distraction, and it's not an illusion. It's not oh the room's on fire. It's uh, the kids are in danger, or now fight a c- boa constrictor, or right. here's a fucking other kind of demon. Like uh, I'll I'll see you next week. Yeah, I'm out. Right. So um, so we pointed out that not every NPC is willing to fight to the death, but most shouldn't necessarily be willing to fight to the murder either. Those that are willing to step into the realm of lethal combat right off the bat are soldiers. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily guards. They may not want to get the kill. They want to get the capture, right? Um, criminals will kill. Cultists will kill. Desperate NPCs will kill. And then you have the, the culture-based lethality, like an orc that is raised under the eye of Groomsh will kill without without question, right? Um, bugbears will kill without question if they're part of the Goblinoid Horde. But rules is written, once the damage has been rolled, you can choose whether or not to deal non-lethal damage, but only with a melee attack that isn't a spell. So if you use a plus one sword, it's magical, you can still pull back on that and and make it a non-lethal attack. When was the last time that you killed a player character, Terry? Yeah, I don't even think I ever had. Obviously, I don't DM as often as, as the both of you you Lots killed you times. killed Eveline, but that, your hand was forced on that. Did I do that? Well, your player blew up a Baylor, killed a Baylor, and a, right. the player the the Baylor. Okay, yeah, I guess I guess in it, it would be that instance then. But uh, I I can't remember the last time that I did it with intent. Yeah, no, no I can't. Dave, like every other week with your guys. No, it's been a little bit. Um, I mean, my favorite death was the nat- three natural 20s in a row. That's just been the standard rule of the table. You roll three 20s in a row, the bad guy dies. Well, it works both ways. Yeah. And I happened to do it once and killed a player. Shit happens. Fuck. Sucks to be you. That is a right? brutal right. homebrew rule. It, it, it's it's in the rules as written for 3.5, and we just kind of adopted it, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, recently it was just I overwhelmed them with numbers. I over minioned, minioned them, and the paladin and the uh, monk, I want to say, uh, took the brunt of it, right? And that's the two of them died. It wasn't just one. The last player character that I killed was Terry's. Really? Yeah. Well, no. well, I killed everybody at the end of the campaign, but that is because I set them up to be the bad guys in the next. Those campaign. guys are doing well then. Yeah, yeah. No, they're all they're all the villains of the next campaign. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so they have come back from the dead. They're evil undead super villains now. Sure. Uh, because I got them all to level 20 and I gave them the opportunity to power up and get a bunch of magic items and then I'm like oh good thank you now I have villains <laughs> good fucking luck devious so anyway um, but no the straight up like killed a killed a player character didn't realize it was like I did not plan that Terry was just a dope on a rope there for a minute and oh, got just... I or death tyrant to, to death so that's they that's tried cool. yeah you know it's fine how do you guys feel about uh, being the DM during a TPK Oh, this, the, the, I mean, the answer is it depends, right? It depends on the situation. That's a crappy answer to give right now. Um, but I I never seek the TPK as the DM. Yeah. You know, for me, if there's a TPK, unless you're like rounding up a campaign or something like you did, it's kind of like things are going wrong. Like it's, you know, nobody, all of the rules are in our favor, right? As the DMs, you know, we can just kill them anytime we want, really. 
Um, so they're, they've really fucked up if they get it. You know, you can. Really? You okay, can. all right. They'll, they'll never come back. They'll never come back. Just take a nose. You know, we, we, we had a friend years ago that introduced us to a lot of a lot of D&D. And his whole thing was, if you're a dick, you'll hear a whistling sound. And it's the sound of wind rushing past the cow's anus as it falls from the sky directly on top of you. <laughs> so Yeah, now every time someone's being a dick, it's do a spot check. Do a listen check. Or perception now. Yeah, and yeah. and then like, you hear a faint you, move. Yeah, you would like smarten the fuck up. So yeah, so I have no problem being the DM in the TPK if it is like a beautiful death, if it is glorious, and 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 the players took fulfillment from it, and they they're happy with how it ended, and you didn't just pull the rug out from under them. That's fine. Yeah, Dave. Oh, I don't give a shit. Like, yeah, I feel bad about killing a character here and there. If the dice are against you, the dice are against you. Yeah, if, I agree with if, that. If it's a TPK, you have fucked up, and I have given you seven or eight outs already. I've hit you with the, okay. I've hit you with the, are you sure? I've hit them with the, is that the best you can do in the situation? And if that's what they continue to follow through with, they have fucked that up. Every counter I put in front of them, if it is insurmountable, I make that very clear. Other than that, there's a way to get around this. If they all die because of it, it's because they're doing it for their own glory. See, so... Don't care. Yeah, but you see, again, and th this is the difference in DM style, is because you continue to adapt mid-session. They're going out of their way to fucking die. Because you will have, have adapted your way away from that a couple of times and warned them and pulled a punch here. Said, really, are you sure? Whereas I'm strict, like, the math has been done, guys. If the dice are, are against you, I am as powerless as you to watch this play out. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate the idea. When I see a death spiral, I, I we had a death spiral. We had a TPK, and we pulled it back last minute. Turned out it was non-lethal damage. They wanted to capture you guys. Um, it was a bunch of demons that were that were being summoned. Um, a bunch of cultists that were summoning demons. And they didn't need everyone to die. They only needed some people to die. We're going to make you choose because it hurts more. And so everybody went down zero hit points and i i stood there i stood up out of my chair and i sat there looking at the map megan was down terry was down you guys were on fire on a roof mm -hmm. and dan was um face down in the mud and uh and then we had acra coming around the back just like i'm the last one standing i'm just gonna i'm just gonna kill whatever i can and go out in a blaze of glory and i'm standing there hands on my head going what the fuck just happened this was supposed to be a social encounter Yep. Fuck my Hello. life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you have a when you decide to have particularly lethal or high stakes combat, like you say, you, like you warn them, Terry. How do you let them know ahead of time instead of just like, are you sure it's a good idea? How do you let them know this is going to be high stakes? Shit is hitting the fan. I use that in my description of the encounters. Like I would say things like, "This is the power of the likes of which you've never even seen." And You're all setting that. the stage. I, I set the scene. Yeah, I set the stage for it, um, so that it it is very fucking obvious that this is uh, this is going to be a very dangerous uh, encounter. Do you paint the pictures well, Dave? Oh yeah, as best I can. Yeah, I'm not I'm not very good with like description. See, I can't even do it now. Right? <laughs> description words. Yeah, description words are not my thing. Adjectives. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, see, they're not my forte, as I just proved. So yeah, I I, I, I try. Yeah, but apparently, <laughs> it's not even English. It's it, Latin. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Description words, yeah, but, not my yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. All right, don't sentence correct. All yeah, it, no. Again, yeah. it, it's really the inflection and the tone that I use. Many. That's what I. Do. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. One of the things that I do though is when when we know that it's going to be a big set piece battle, I set that up about three sessions ahead of time. You have to get to it, and there's always for me traveling to the big encounter. You should never have a death spiral on the side of a road with a random encounter. Right. If you do, you done fucked up in your random encounter table. Right? And that's just me. And some people like will will say buy the dice. But I mean again, I build my random encounter tables months in advance. And they're geared to specific levels of gameplay based on how much damage because I keep track of how much damage the guys do every round. I kind of know what the DPS is. DPR, I guess. It's not damage per second, it's damage per round. But, like, I, I, I get that. I And I think about that ahead of time. If I fucked up and we end up spiraling out, like, on the side of the road, that's... 
It's bad times. Mm -hmm. I want you to feel the weight, the dread. You're going to see the the evidence of the horde before you get to it to build tension. I'll give them the out where, for instance, maybe it's a roadside encounter and things are not going well. Well, the, the lieutenant will then get off his horse uh, and start to wander over. And now there's an opportunity for you to go and steal the horse and get out of there. Right? Like, there's always... Uh, yeah, I'll give you a, a back mechanism. door or two. Yeah. yeah. When do you pull your punches? Do you pull your punches? No. I do pull my punches. I, I pull my punches if I think that the alternative is going to be more fun. So that, uh, you know, if if it will be make for a better encounter or better situation if they are captured or if the, the poison uh, gives them some trippy fucked up dream or, or something. So... I don't necessarily pull my punches if the math is just against them, and uh, you know I've gi I've given all of the warnings, um, but I will pull my punches if I think there's a better situation that can come from it. When a party member is making death saves and the enemy is standing over them, do you focus on getting the kill, or do you move on to the next biggest threat in the room and neutralize you know the next most threatening person? It depends on the motivation. Depends on the creature. The yeah, creature, yeah. Okay, generic NPC. Uh, it depends if the party just sorry if the party just bust in the room and killed a bunch of the bandits and the last bandit is standing over you know an unconscious player yeah he's gonna fucking kill him period every time right it, it depends on the motivation it depends on the situation I, I don't have a catch-all answer Terry um I would I would if it's kill or be killed they should kill them the enemy would kill them I've discovered that standing over the unconscious body that is bleeding out and saying, let me free or I will kill him. Yeah. Is a good way out. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you're absolutely Never. right. It's, it's, I see, and, but I struggle with this. Would a wolf go for the kill or would they protect the territory, the cubs or, or like, does, does the random lion go for that kill if there are three other guys standing there? If the one guy goes down and is no longer a threat, does an animal go for that rip the throat out and then face off against the others? Mm -hmm. I think a hyena would. I'm not sure a lion would. It depends how things are. If the lion is surrounded by two other PCs, then no, he's going to attack the PCs, right? But yeah. if he's far removed from that and has the opportunity to without incurring lots of repercussion, yeah, he's going to go for the kill. And I think that's that's a big yeah that's a big deal. Do you guys ever use NPCs with uh, non lethal damage? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I don't think it, the the situation the the objective of the NPC isn't always to kill them, right? It might be to neutralize them. It might be to take them back to somebody else. And yeah, so I don't always use lethal damage. Yes, but I won't tell them that. No, they need if, they need to fear. If that makes sense, we recently had the player that I kill most of the time. Uh, the druid it turned into a crocodile and was exploring down the river and came across as an one abolith. does, you know. Yeah, yeah, and he, and he came across an abolith uh, by himself. He was hundreds of feet away from the rest of the party, uh, and they fought, and he went unconscious. It's like, all right, time out. What are the rest of you doing? And then they managed to get back, and it turned out that the player was still alive and just unconscious and blah blah blah. But I kind of used that as the you know, motivation. It's like, all right, we're going to stop you for a second and we'll see you guys next week, right? You're like, use that suspension, you know, the suspense. Yeah, I I will definitely use non-lethal. There's always a reason to keep the PCs alive. There's always a reason, except when you get into desperation, revenge, or obligation. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, when it's power, knocking them down a peg and taking their shit is usually enough to enrage them and make a lifelong enemy and add shit to the campaign. But I find that harder to do when I've got a creature with the intelligence less than four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And killing the PCs isn't the worst thing that can happen to them. Oh, either. not by a goddamn sight. Yeah. As they most don't know of my that players though. know. Oh, most of my players have figured that shit out by now. Anyways, do you guys have any final inspirations um, before we wrap up? Killing the PCs is not the worst thing that can happen to them. <laughs> it's my, honestly my final inspiration. Wait, wait, what's, what's worse? Uh, killing their pets, uh, taking their shit. The PCs, I have said it before, but not for about a year or so. Fucking get over it. Your items are going to get taken. If the DM giveth, the DM taketh away. <laughs> If it's on the character sheet, it's up for grabs. Yeah, 100%, yeah. 100, 100 Dave. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, including the numbers, by the way, because I will straight up cripple you. I mean, poor Megan got her leg shot off at the knee mm -hmm. and ended up having 15-foot movement there. As a paladin, that was bad. That was 
bad times. Yeah. She rounded out three months of playing like that. Like, that was not a good way to go. Uh, it's Sometimes it's it's rough and it's shitty as a player. But even, like, when my character lost his leg, for me, it's like, okay, I just kind of want to see how this plays out. Like, if we did, if we weren't able to reverse it, I'll, I'll just lean into it. You know, I'll see what happens. I get it. Leaned into it. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what makes you a great player is you... You're ready for the next adventure, whatever that's going to be. I think I've certainly grown right. as a player. You didn't well, see me five years ago. It was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, no, you were you were never the nightmare at the table. It's like being the second drunkest guy at the party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, any final thoughts? But I, I mean, I guess if I had some final thoughts, I would say I would say um, be adaptable. Don't don't be married to an idea. Don't be so rigid in the, it needs to be this way, this way, and this way. And if this happens, then this happens. And if this happens, then this happens. You can't, and I know this is going to piss some people off, but you cannot plan for 100% of the outcomes. So don't, I don't even try. I just keep it as it goes. But that's just my style. It works for me, right? Just be able to roll with the punches and uh, and modify it when you need to. That's That's, you know, nobody's going to have fun if you're not going to make it fun. And if it's not being fun, make it fun. The, yeah, yeah, I get that. See, my thing is all about listening and reacting, but I need to know the parameters of the world so well that I don't have to. Yeah, I never, I never worry about mechanics while I'm playing the game. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's just it is like I know my players, my players, and I like we have all been friends. I mean, fuck, you've slept with half of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so aggressive. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, I've known them all for you know 15, 20 years at this point. Yeah. So I know who they are. I know what motivates them. And I know what's going to interest them. I, I realize that uh, giving deep storyline and, and deep thought to this one player is not going to appeal to the other. So I need to find that balance. And it, it, it works because I know them as people. I know what was going to motivate them. You play the people as much as you play the characters. Oh, big 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 time mm-hmm. i'm trying they're they're the audience they're the people that we're trying to keep entertained as dms they're they're the audience that might be the um wisest thing you've said on this podcast oh i thought that was brilliant actually what you said there yeah, yeah. um don't say anything else <laughs> yeah go go on a high note dave um <laughs> <laughs> well and we're yeah. back <laughs> Fuck, yeah. Jeez. Oh, um the last thing that i want to leave with I, i'm going to circle back to the very beginning where i said um, there are really three things that we notice first about um, an NPC. It is the race, the occupation, and then their social role, right? When we talk about motivations, when we talk about tactics, an elf is going to react differently than a goblin. A minotaur is going to react differently than a loxodon. And we know that inherently when we choose which NPC to give them. We know the butcher is going to act differently than the cultist, who will act differently than the butler. We know that when we choose our NPCs. So when you are choosing your NPC, we often say, wouldn't it be funny if... But think about the tactics that you're bringing to the table with each one. Are they liable to be out for revenge? The more that they have at stake, as in power or items, the more they have to lose the more that they're going to rely on these different tactics in different ways. And it's something to to always keep in mind when you're building an NPC or when you're choosing an NPC, uh, whether it's in homebrew or you're fleshing out a module. So that's all for our discussion on NPC motivations and tactics. The next time we circle back to discussing enemies, we're going to be looking at the actual stat blocks that 5th edition has to offer for NPCs. So subscribe or follow and check back regularly to see what inspirations and insights that we'll have for you in the future. Next week, we're going to be returning to our conversation on downtime activities and what DMs and players can do to flesh out a campaign outside of combat. Thanks for listening to another episode of the It's a Mimic podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com, as well as a store for some titillating merch. You changed it. I did. We also rely on word of mouth to get news of the podcast out there to the community, so please pass the word to everyone you know that we're available on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as most podcast apps. Thanks again for listening to the It's a Mimic podcast, where you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> Including Terry and Dick. <laughs> I would have nailed it that time. <laughs> this has been an It's a Mimic production. Inquiries, requests, and questions for our mailbags can be sent to info at itsamimic.com. What's your favorite NPC you've ever had in the game? Yeah, oh, Bernard the Bard. Bernard the Bard? Bernard the Bard, easily.
I name dropped him like a hundred episodes ago, and he hasn't come up since. And I remember Terry said, "You mean Bernard the Bard?" <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a friend Bernard. We called him Barnyard. Right. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Bernard always pops up in all of our like our campaigns. You know, he pops up for some reason. Maybe he's the NPC that'll lead you to the next thing because they're just so hopelessly lost. Maybe he is the ex bard turned merchant that is now selling things. He just he pops up. It's it's just he, fun to say whenever I introduce someone as Bernard. You know, the table goes wild. Everybody loves Bernard. Right. Did you give him the rest of the party? Because I have a whole party for him. No, I yeah, I, I know there's a whole party Dude, for I him. I don't even want to ask who else is there. Well, there's Eric the Cleric. I hate this. Mary and the Barbarian. This bothers me. Yeah. Orlock the Warlock. No. <laughs> Engage the Mage. No. Yeah. <laughs> God damn. Uh, for me, probably Jormungand, the Goblin. Oh, uh, Jormie. I, I learned lessons from you. So, for the folks at home, I'm sure they've heard about Jormungand. But he was a horse that was turned into a goblin by the deck of many things. Uh, but he taught me the lesson of, uh, it doesn't matter who I want them to like. It's who, the, the, the players decide who they like. You know, and uh, and you have to lean into that. Because they're telling you that's what makes it fun for them. And so I learned a lesson with Jormie. Yormi is still kicking around, although he's been through some shit. Is he really? Yeah, he's got he's got one arm and one eye, and he's like got a circlet of intelligence, so he's the smartest person in the room really? and knows it. But he's just been weathered and seen it all at this point. And because he was a horse first, and he's magically a goblin, he's not aging. The last update I got for Yormi, which now would seem ages ago in gameplay time for you, was that he was had ended up being like a tribal chief or something. Yeah, he, like... he's gone through some some significant changes. But once a campaign, they run into him, and he comes in, and like at this point, he smacks the players upside the head and says, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> and like drags them on their on the, like this, get back on the path, and this is your mission. We have to save the fucking world. Yeah. And then they go off doing those, oh, and, and he, <laughs> he fucks off. And he used to be like, I can't even do the voice. He used to do the voice for Yorm. And well, it's, it's been so long. It's right. right yeah, and uh, he sounded like Gizmo. And he was ones. complete accident. <laughs> complete accident, deck of many things, turned a horse into a goblin, and uh, and here we are. Hey, that's okay. We were doing Mad Mage a little while ago, and they hit an Elder Rune on one of the magic gates it opens, mm -hmm. and a goblin spawned. So, I mean, goblins just popping up everywhere. Yeah, yeah. But this goblin couldn't speak goblin, because he wasn't actually a goblin. Actually, this goblin. one only spoke a goblin, which they couldn't <laughs> communicate with him. Perfect. So, that's yeah, I'm loving this, yeah. That's the best. <laughs> Right, so they were sitting there, and then no joke. Here, let me show. I got a picture. We're sitting there on the river, and uh, uh, oh, let's see. This fucking airplane comes by. This fucking airplane comes this by. Fucking airplane. All right, and you can see Fuck he's you, like man. ten feet off of the river. Oh wow, fucking yeah. just buzzing right past us, right? So, and then there was another float plane that was coming he was by. So unimpressed in that picture. Yeah, wow. I was not happy. <laughs> Fuck it out of my airspace. <laughs> It was so nice and quiet, and then he comes by, but yeah, we had a float plane landing in front of us, and there was a helicopter buzzing around. This is so nice, sitting around with dudes drinking beer, talking about shotguns and airplanes. Thank God. Yeah. Fuck off. Studio B, kicking it off. <laughs> Studio B, the B team. I know. Thanks for listening. Bye.